All right, first I'm going to repeat to you that I don't expect you to memorize this. I simply want you not to have a hole in your knowledge. It's impossible for you to get the full sweep of all 3,200 years and all five waves. And so I'll repeat. The most important wave is waves are 1, 2, and 5. Why 1 and 2? Because Shang, Zhou, Qin, Han set that foundation, and wave 3 just really builds on it. It, it adds some interesting things. Something really amazing happens here, incredibly amazing, like world historical amazing. It makes me sad and awestruck every time I teach this moment. Um, but overall, it's, it's a Confucian centralized bureaucracy. It's, you know, it's, it's everything that the Han was, but it, it just develops more. It just becomes more advanced. So it's interesting, but it's not real decisive in making any sorts of changes. Um, and so that's why this is the one to skip. So let's start. The POD, as you'll remember, the northern and southern dynasties, the Xianbei in the north and the, the Han refugees down south on the Yangtze River, right? That was a POD. They were finally unified by Sui Wendi. And so he puts Humpty Dumpty back together again permanently. And his son, Sui Yangdi, after his father did all this hard work to defeat the northern and southern, he was, a, he was, by the way, he was from the Xianbei. So here we have a, a Cenocized former barbarian um, person who now starts a dynasty that actually contributes to China. That's just interesting. Um, there will only be one more, random fact, there will only be one more Han Chinese dynasty for the rest of his history. No, I'm sorry, the Song is, and then the, the Ming is. But the rest, the Yuan and the Qing, are, are uh, actually barbarian. So anyway, so uh, Wendy, kind of like Yo Bon, he's, he's low taxes, um, a, a good... Confucian guy. He does some important things. Unlike that loser Jin dynasty during the period of disunity who did reunify China shortly, but then did feudalism and it fell apart quickly, this guy instead very decisive. He reinstated the Confucian civil service examinations. So he, he went back to the Han way of centralized bureaucracy, Confucian civil service exams. That's huge. He could have chosen otherwise. He didn't. So again, Confucius, we see Confucius keep on sort of like rising from the dead. We saw it after Qin, and now we see it after the POD when, uh, when the Jin didn't, didn't go the Confucian way or the Han way. So, uh, so Wendy did that. His son, Yang Di, quite a womanizer, quite extravagant, quite addicted to pleasure, but also did some <clears throat> great things. One thing particularly. Because the Yellow River was so far over a thousand miles removed from the Yangtze River down south, and because during that period of, of uh, exile, when the barbarians pushed the Han Chinese, the, you know, the real Chinese, down to the Yangtze River, and they were there for literally 200 years. They built cities. Nanjing, again, that's when Nanjing, the city today, there's an international school in Nanjing. Mr. Atkinson taught there. Um, Nanjing came, come, became a city during the period of disunity because of that refugee period. So lots of cities sprung up, and this is, uh, this is when that southern shift happens. That's the most important thing about the POD, is the southern shift of demographics, population. Suddenly it's more populated down south. And that has consequences. The climate's different. Is geography destiny? You can grow rice down here. And they imported Vietnamese rice, a particular uh, uh, strain, <coughs> not the right word, uh, that you could grow in, in multiple seasons and so forth from Vietnam. And it, ex it expanded the yield and the productivity. And long story short, China's population tripled because they're growing rice now instead of wheat. Population tripled. Commerce, because of the expansion of population and of rice and uh, 
the wealth that comes from that. Commerce is now more lucrative down south in the Yangtze. So the economics also shift south. Remember, the Yellow River is kind of dry, and, um, and it's just not as fertile. So there's a lot more resource wealth down south. And so that means that the economic center shifts south. Wendy built his capital in the same place. The Sway built their capital in the same place, the Way River, right? And he needed to get the rice from the south to feed the troops in the north. Because again, we've always got those, those barbarians up north, right? And so we gotta, we gotta always have food for armies. And also, if we ever need more manpower up north, we've gotta have fast transport. So how are you gonna do it? Build a giant canal. Build the world's biggest canal. The Grand Canal, have you heard of it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I mean, magnificent. It's a thousand mile man-made river, basically. China, I asked you at the beginning of the year, what direction do these rivers flow? Give me one sec. What directions do they, they both flow east-west? This is a problem. China, problem, solution. Let's just get a few million people and uh, make them build a, a river version of the Great Wall. Because that's what the Grand Canal is. It connects the Yangtze to the Yellow and ultimately goes up to Beijing uh, a bit later. And so it's about 1,200 miles long, and it allows very cheap and easy transportation of goods and troops north and south, all right? Unifying economically north and south. So now trade can go north and south as well as east and west. And so this is a massive, massive accomplishment of this guy. Now, look at the dates of the Sui Dynasty. Look at the dates. How long did they last? Do your math. You can do it, elite school students. Thank you. 29 years. All right. AP, yeah, you're going to like pass with a three, two, one. Um, see, I can count backwards. Can you? All right. Um, so what do you think? Why do you think it fell after only 29 years? Sorry, Mo. I, Mo, Mo had a question. She was nice and patient. Okay, so what did he, what did he do so that they moved it down south so they could grow rice? Right? What did they No, no, no. The, the, the growing rice was, was from the period of disunity where all the, the Han Chinese from the Yellow River had to run south. So what was the point? What was the point that you made about the rice and the rice? And the rice can only be grown in the in the Yangtze South. It can't be grown up north. It's too dry and cold. But did he move down there? No, the Chinese did for two hundred years during the POD. So again, during the period of disunity when the Shenbei came and conquered the Yellow River. If Apaches, Navajos, and Cherokees invaded New York from the north, where would the New Yorkers run? Florida. Florida, where you can grow sugar cane. Where did the Yellow River people, Han Chinese, the elite Chinese from the Han Dynasty, where did the Han Chinese, Han Dynasty, where did the elite <laughs> Chinese run, the civilized people? South to the Yellow River. So Be because the barbarians literally conquered the north. That's what the Xianbei did. So the point basically was just to get to The point is because there were cities down here and for 200 years a massive powerful economy had grown in this Yangtze, new Yangtze River development, he needed the rice, he needed the troops, he needed to be able to connect the northern economy and the southern economy. And so he did that by building a man-made river. And it's still there today. It's still there today. The Grand Canal is still in use today. <laughs> this is... This is uh, 1,400 years ago, and it's still there, and it looks really nice. He built a royal highway along the whole thing. <clears throat> so again, though, so a 29-year, 89, 99, 09, good. Uh, I had to do that. Uh, why do you think it fell, Andrew? Why do you think the sway fell? I'll ask you another question that maybe will give you a clue. What's our other really short dynasty that did amazing things and then fell really fast? And why did Qin fall? Why did the people get pissed? Pardon my French. I mean angry. That's more boring, isn't it? Well, it is. You don't want to write it in an essay, certainly. Um, no, Andrew? Qin fell because the people got angry because they were what? Speak loud enough for this deaf old man to hear. 
Dude. Straight them out. On what? On the farmers. Holy mother of God. I'm going to force labor on the farmers. What did Chin build? A wall. <laughs> yeah, he built the Great Wall. That means high taxes. That means fathers and brothers are taken from their land, their families, and, and forced to go north and work for, you know, during the harvest, during the planting season, all this sort of thing. They die up there. Same thing's happening here, right? It's, it costs a lot of tax money, and it costs a lot of forced labor, and the people get angry. Any Koreans in the house? Yangdi also tries three times to conquer all of Korea, and three times he fails. Each attempt oh. is each attempt is a more massive army, and he can't get those <laughs> bastard little Koreans, pardon my French, to submit. The Koreans are cool this way. Korean history is cool this way. Every China has over and over again. China tries to come into Korea, and they're like they kick the Koreans, little 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 brothers. Boom! Stay down. And Korea's like no. <laughs> right? And they just kick them back. And time's like, so when the second time, Yangdi second time, bigger army, mm, stay down. Korean music, no. <laughs> right? Three times. And, and they lost the third time. They lost the third time. And that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. Look, the Grand Canal, you made us build that. Three times you tried to conquer Korea. We're dying there. You're taxing us there. And they rose up and overthrew him. And this starts the tongue. But notice, the sway is... The Sui reestablished a centralized bureaucracy. The Sui gave an economic infrastructure to China that will incredibly, incredibly multiply its power, the Grand Canal. And they revived Confucianism. By the way, Wendy, he conquered in the name of Buddha. For those of you who think that Buddhism is this totally like peaceful religion, they have a tradition of um, righteous warfare. I am the Kakravartan king. I am unifying China in order to promote peace and Buddhist harmony through war. Now, you know, there's always a way to find an excuse for war, isn't there? Um, and so the Tong comes in. The Tong from 618 to 906. A 300 year. Your, your classic 300-year dynasty. The average length of a major dynasty is 300 years. Again, I, I really wonder if America is going to make it to 300 years. It's at 225, and things don't look good. I, I really wonder if it's going to make it to 300 years. Seriously, you think it's going to last forever just because it like, has lasted for a couple of centuries? No. The French Revolution, I'm sure Louis XVI thought, oh, la-di-da, la-di-da. There's no chance that the people will get so angry that they're just going to like finally go like starving. Anyway. Okay, so the Tang Dynasty. They overthrow. What's important about the Tang Dynasty? They did really good porcelain. Let me just list them real quick. First of all, the capital, Chang'an. which is today Xi'an. We're still in the Yellow River Valley. The Silk Road came into Chang'an. And Chang'an is a classic urban design, walled capital city, north-south, rectangular, perfectly laid out, <coughs> grid streets, wardens where uh, there are different districts and all sorts of things. So perfectly, perfectly um, symmetrical, and ordered, and all sorts of stuff. But the cool thing about it, and when we talk about the Tong, grown-ups don't normally use this word. You feel silly using it. Splendor. It's a splendid dynasty. You'll see on, the, on, your, on your reading. Even Murphy uses it, and he's pretty sarcastic. The splendor of the Tong. It was splendid. It was a, simply a splendid dynasty. This is the golden age of Chinese... Um, Cosmopolitanism. What does it mean to be cosmopolitan? You, you do want to have a vocabulary so that you can sound like more than a, an American public school student. Um, you may as well get some bang for your buck here. What does cosmopolitanism mean? Familiar. Nope. To be urbane, doesn't it? What does urbane mean? Classy. Classy. 
Um, what is okay, Cosmo? 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 <laughs> the universe, the universe, everything. And and polity, polis, Greek word, city. So a universal city, guys, hear this. Connect the Silk Road to a universal city. How does the Silk Road make it more universal? Can anybody connect the dots here? Lots of people can come in from everywhere. From everywhere. Worldwide. So check, yeah, it's, it is a world city. It's, it's the biggest city in the world at the time. It's the richest city in the world at the time. And it's the most culturally diverse Emma city at the time. It's amazing. And uh, I, will, I will come back to how amazing it is when we see uh, wave four shortly. In this city, they allowed Muslims, because the Muslims explode into world history in 622. Notice the Tong is the same time that Muhammad, four years later, Muhammad gets his vision. So, and Islam very quickly expands within two generations. Within 60 years, it conquers like India and North Africa. And, uh, so within two generations. So by 700. Whatever. Again, let's not. Let's not. Sorry, I got lost. Let's not. Let's not. We're dealing with five thousand years of history. If we're off by a couple of years, it's not even worth like sniffing over. So. Um, Sorry. So Muslims are in China's capital city, and they build mosques, and, and the Tang Emperor allows it. Cool, build your mosque. Jews are in the Tang capital city, and they build synagogues. Cool, build your synagogue. Buddhists, they have temples. Hindus, they have temples. Zoroastrians from Persia, they have temples. And Christians from the Byzantine Empire, Nestorian Christians, Central Asian Christians, not European ones, have churches. Cool, have your church. Confucians have their temples. Taoists have their temples. It is cosmopolitan and it is the most tolerant, 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 splendid thing, because the Chinese are like a negative golden rule. I wouldn't want, right? So um, multicultural. Music comes in from Persia, from the Turks, from all over the world, and it's a world music scene. It's a very cool place. It really is the Paris or New York City of the Middle Ages. Um, dance, art, all sorts of stuff is all world influenced. So it's a world culture. It's a world city. Fashion, everything. It's really cool to look at the, the art from this period. Um, okay, so we've got our capital. Oh! It's also important for another religious revolution, and this is, what's that famous Japanese Buddhism? What's it called? Shintoism. That's not Buddhism. No. That's not Buddhism. Zen? Shinto is not Buddhism. That's native Japanese animism. <laughs> it starts with a Z. Zen? Zen. Haven't you heard of Zen? Come on, surely you've been to some shishi restaurant called Zen. You know, like, oh, and every, you know the, the water costs $500. Yeah, I went to Zen. <laughs> Zen Buddhism. Zen Buddhism. That's what Japan calls it. Japan got it from China. Because the Japanese and Koreans come to the Tang Dynasty capital. They come to this Chang'an. And Korea takes back... Chan Buddhism, it's originally Chan Buddhism, C-H-A-N, it's a Chinese invention. Instant enlightenment, you don't need to study and read and all this sort of stuff, it comes instantly. Um, and, the Jap and the Koreans and Japanese come to Chang'an, they study Confucianism here, and this is when Japan starts writing. Do you hear that? This is when Japan starts writing. Do the math. Shang Dynasty 1600 to zero. Shang Dynasty started 1600 BC. We are now in 700, 600 BC, uh, AD. 16 is 2200 years China has been alive, and Japan is just now starting to write. So China would be like, China's 32 years old now. Japan is, if they started writing in 600, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's early Tang. Japan's a 14-year-old. China's a 32-year-old. What about Korea? Same thing. Korea and Japan both become literate, historically, you know, writing. How was the Korean army so strong? 
Actually, it was weather. It was naval attacks, and it was a lot of bad luck with weather. I just like to sort of give the Koreans a little tickle. Make them feel good. Haiting. Um, you know that? Haiting? Haiting. You're not Korean. I am. You know it. So tell her. What does it mean? Haiting. What is it? It's fighting. It's fighting in Korean. You're not Korean. Uh, you're American, man. Okay. That's how they say fighting, these weird Koreans. Fighting. Um, okay, so, yeah, so Zen Buddhism. These Chan Buddhists also, these Chan Buddhists also, guys, you'll like this, these Chan Buddhists also invent what Bruce Lee made popular. Kung Fu. Kung Fu for you Americans, or... Kung Fu. Isn't that a little weird that Buddhists would be, like, doing martial arts? Um, who invents it? The, the Chan Buddhists. And why do they do it? Because during the period of disunity, actually, and, and the early Tang, when they were still, like, unifying everything, they needed to be able to defend themselves against attackers. And so they practiced this martial art because they're in monasteries, right? Um, I actually went to the monastery last summer and, uh, and met the, 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 the lead monk and saw... A, have you heard of the Shaolin monks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're... they're yeah, so, so, the Shaolin, so the Shaolin monastery is where, is where Kung Fu was invented and that's a Chan Buddhist monastery. And finally, one last thing that, that these Chan Buddhists did. In order to be able to meditate and seek enlightenment, they needed to stay awake. Like you guys, in order for you to like pass meaningless tests in Mobio, so you can go get a job, you know, as a tool for somebody, as a tool for somebody, go get a tool. I want to be a pot who makes a lot of money. So in order for you to pass these worthless, meaningless tests that you're doing to sell your souls to some corporate entity in your futures, um, you need to stay awake. They needed to stay awake. How did they do it? They drank tea. <laughs> tea enters Chinese culture as a like major beverage because of Zen Buddhists, Chan Buddhists. Wait, it was originally Chinese. It is, but it's a southern it's a southern uh, plant, and so tea enters China before before the the POD slash Tang. It was all wine. Tea was it was all wine. There you go. <laughs> um, so yeah, so tea. Tea first starts as a religious meditative drink. I need to stay awake so I can meditate and get enlightenment. I gotta pass my enlightenment exam. I can't get sleepy. All right. Um, oh, can I do this? Where's my camera? All right, moving on. Moving on, moving on, moving on. You got all this stuff? <laughs> what else did the Tong do? All right, I'm moving on. Tape, tape. We're moving on. Um, the other things that, that the... This is another reason that I skipped this one, because again... We live in a post-poetic, post-cultured age. We watch fart videos on YouTube now. We don't read poetry. It's more than three words. Oh, my God. A bug. Um, so, it's the golden age of Chinese lyric poetry. Wait, so all that was... No, we're, we're in the Tang now. Oh, we're still in the Tang. Yeah. All that was about Chang'an. Yeah, so Chang'an is a Tang capital. Oh, okay. So, again, so... so Korea and Japan become sinicized, yeah? Is Chang'an the same as Sion? Yeah. Yeah, it's Wei River. Wei River, Wei River. Yeah. Yeah. Is it lyric poetry? Lyric poetry, yeah. Um, so this is their golden age. Chinese today still, still recite the most famous ones. Who you'll read about, there are a couple of really nice um, examples of Li Po. I always call them Li Po. I know, there's two ways, don't no. um, and this is, again, this is kind of like the period of disunity. This is gorgeous stuff. Li Po was, as you'll read, he was famed for uh, his solitary 
nature loving, wine loving, um, ecstatic really. He would just like get ecstatic in his poetry. And the images typically of moons reflecting on water, him drinking with his shadow or his reflection alone. And the story goes, he was uh, drunk in a boat and the reflection of the moon at night was in the water and he reached out to hug the moon, embrace the moon, kiss the moon, and drowned. <laughs> Happily. <laughs> uh, you know, the, is it true? We don't know, but we love it. Um, so it's a golden age of lyric poetry. And finally, the other important thing here. We saw that tea came in. What do we drink tea in? Porcelain. Porcelain. So th th these are boring things until you reach wave four when China is mugged by the tea and China addicted British Empire. The British mug China because they're spending all of British silver on tea and porcelain. And so good luck or bad luck this tea and porcelain because it's really what leads to China being mugged. They dispute it with me when we read it. There is no only a hypocrite would say that Britain was nothing other than a gangster empire. No, not okay. But they also got super rich. Yeah. They didn't. They didn't force the British to come and spend all their silver on tea. Uh, but anyway. Okay. So uh, those of you who are into feminism, Tong women are famous. We see, we see statues of Tong women on horseback. Speak, please. We see statues of Tong women on horseback playing polo. Masculine, right? Just like these are tough women. And the, the, the body image of beauty, the ideal uh, image of, of female beauty during the Tong, all of the statues, which we presume are going to be of attractive women, right? You're going to make a statue of like a woman that you think is attractive. They're chubby. They've got like double chins. You know, it's just that, so you've got this, you've got this fleshy, fleshy type of beauty, and they are playing polo. In the Song Dynasty, this will all change. Foot binding will start in the Song Dynasty, and the little China doll, the little, you know, prim China doll thing will start in the Song Dynasty. So in the Tong, though, women were like, really, really, they're allowed to play polo on horseback. Did they have to ride side down? No. Oh. No, they did not have to be proper at all. Okay. I will say that. Okay, so I've got to move on. So, 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 please. Oh, sorry. So this is a golden age of Chinese art. Everybody go to sleep because we're talking about art. I know. I'm not, no offense to those of you who are like, hey, don't insult me. Those of you who are like, yeah, that's, I'm talking to you. Um, the Anlu Shan Rebellion. How did the Tong fall? The Tong fell because of a, it's a classic story, if you go to Chinatown, there's a restaurant, it's great, Xi'an Food, um, and the tourist uh, strip of Chinatown, next to the MRT exit, uh, called the Yang Guifei uh, Cafe. Yang Guifei, she's the famous concubine, who brought down the Tong Dynasty. And she brought it down because she was um, the love of Emperor Xuanzong. <coughs> So this guy, he's a really, really, really famous emperor. He was a great emperor. He ruled for like 40, 50 years. His court, Emperor Xuanzang, his court was filled with Li Po, the great poets, the great calligraphers, the great painters, the great philosophers. He had a highly, highly sophisticated, quote, splendid court. He was the Queen Elizabeth Renaissance type ruler. That's right. Xuanzang. Xuanzang, yeah. Yeah, and so, and so, for the, for the first three decades of his rule, before he became a doddering old fool, he was a great emperor. But then a young concubine, Yang Guifei, one of China's five beauties, and I might, it might be four or six, it's okay. Um, Yang Guifei, one of, the, one of the classic beauties of China, concubine, attracts him, wraps him around her finger. Remember the king who cried wolf? It's a similar story. Emperor becomes so obsessed with his concubine, that he starts doing favors for her family, making her brother a general, her uncle a general, all sorts of stuff like that. And so um, 
long story short, somebody gets offended by the power that her family is gaining, a general uh, who is not friends with her, her family, who he's given power to, and he ends up uh, rebelling, attacking the capital, almost ending the Tang Dynasty there. Um, they burn down the capital. Xuanzang has to run away with his concubine, and his soldiers um, refuse to continue serving him if he lets her live, because they blame it all on her. You finagled favors from the emperor that brought this catastrophe to us. And now we're having to fight rebellion on all sides and all sorts of stuff. And a lot of us died, and it's all this beauty's fault. And so on the road, uh, as they're escaping, the story goes. She's taken uh, up to a Buddhist monastery on the roadside as they're passing. And um, a, 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 a yellow silk scarf is taken out, and she's strangled to death and left on the side of the road there. He's heartbroken. His dynasty survives. He's depressed. He abdicates the throne for his son. The important point of this story, though, is that it does cause the decline of the Tang dynasty. And this is in, yeah, around 756, about halfway through. In order for the dynasty to keep control, they had to give a lot of power to those who defended them, generals, mostly. And, and so it became like the central government became less powerful because they had to give too many privileges to, to people. And so decline happens. That's really all there is to say about the Tong. It was not a huge decline. It was not a massive catastrophe because when the Tong finally did fall in 906, there is a 50-year um, competition for who is going to like get the mandate of heaven. It's a... It, 50 years, that's a, that's a hiccup in Chinese history. And, uh, and the Song. <coughs> the Song dynasty is formed. And they just continue. They, they tighten everything up. Um, they, got the they got the mandate. So, Han Pio Di Sui Tong Song. Tong and Song are really 600 years of, of overall prosperous, splendid, advanced Han dynasty stuff. Because the fall of the Tong was not really disastrous. They quickly recovered. Yeah? Also, on Lushan, are they still in power? Oh, An Lushan was the general who rebelled. And so it's called the An Lushan Rebellion. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, this emperor is, is really, uh, he's really fascinating, actually. He wrote poetry that we have. China's emperors wrote poetry and they painted. It, like, like, that was normal because they, were, they had to be Confucian. So they truly were. They had to be Zhengzi. They had to be Zheng. They had to practice the Confucian arts. So you've got, like, over 100 emperors who, who wrote poetry just, and painted. Just weird from a Western point of view. Um, the Northern Song. The prosperity continues, the splendor continues. This is the golden age of painting. Song Dynasty painting, like the, the earth and uh, the, the mountain and water paintings, that type of landscape painting, this is its golden age. So this is when Chinese art blooms. Here it's more pottery and poetry, and here it's art. So this is their artistic renaissance. Politically, let me just show you the difference. If you ever do become a, uh, interested in getting a Chinese library, Harvard has recently been publishing uh, uh, a new history of China. And so when Harvard publishes something, it's a big deal. They're making a big deal of it. I read both of these. This is the Tong. And it's, uh, notice what they call it. What do they call it? China's cosmopolitan empire, the Tang. It was a world empire. Right? It was cosmopolitan. That's what they call it. Splendid. World cool. um, and the Tang capital city, by the way, was great. You had like all night restaurants. You had um, karaoke joints without the, you know, CD. 
Um, you had brothels with concubines who would dance for you and other things. You had um, acrobats on the streets. You had all sorts of storytellers, just cool stuff. And then what do, we, what do we call this one? Here's the song. Look at the difference. I'm, I'm actually demonstrating. When we talk about the song, we talk about it being the age of Confucian rule. This is really interesting. In a weird way. Somebody said it really well. They said this. The Song Dynasty is the most fascinating and the most boring dynasty in all of China's history. How can it be the most fascinating and the most boring? Because politically, they made the civil service exams where you had to study that Confucian stuff and pass that three-day SAT in order to be an elite. And if you didn't, you weren't an elite. If your father was a businessman, you couldn't even take the exam. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, but there were always ways to abuse the system. Okay. And they ended those loopholes. You couldn't buy your way in. You couldn't cheat your way in. And they did it through, like, you know how the SAT has all these rules when you come in now? you got to, like, put all your stuff against the wall and take off all your clothes so we can, like, you know, see if you got the answers written in on your armpit or other parts of your body. Really? Right? No. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, like, not like all like, no, no, no. But, uh, but, but... Yeah, they, they had all sorts of measures, to, to anti-cheating measures. Because people, we have it. There are museums, there's a museum in, in the Song capital of Kaifeng. Where that picture was taken, Tate? That picture of me under arrest? That's in the Song capital, Kaifeng. Um, there's a museum there of uh, a, uh, an underwear that had all of the Shujing and the Analects and all the Confucian classics written in it in minuscule script. It's like a t-shirt, your undershirt. I've got the entire Shujing like, written on my undershirt. Jeez. Because I've got to write essays on it, I'm supposed to have memorized it, right? So, um, anyway, so the civil service exams now, they are, they are practically foolproof. You can't cheat on them. And this led to the most, like, decent, um, just, just an age of honest government. It was efficient. It was, and the Confucian officials here deserve to be scholar officials. They really were. Daddy didn't buy their way in. They really were scholars. Merit here. Merit. It worked. Yeah. Could you only take the exam once? No, you could, could take you it as many times as you want. Every three years. Uh, Some people failed in 2000 and then in 2003, and they study until 2006, and they fail again, and they study until 2009, and they fail again. I'm going to start separating you. And um, yeah, and so you could go 15 years, every three years failing. And I'm going to be an elite for 15 years, and I can't. This is important during wave four, because somebody goes crazy, loses their mind, and discovers something fascinating. But we'll get there when it happens. As a mental breakdown, or else a religious vision, I'll just go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. Depending on your point of view about revelation, divine revelation, it's either a mental episode or God talking to somebody. That's, that's up to you, historians doubt the God talking to somebody part. They don't have evidence of it. Um, we all know that people have psychotic episodes, but that's up to you. This is challenging for those of you who believe in revealed divine God's talking to me stuff, because in 19, I'm sorry, 1860, <coughs> 1855, a guy who failed the exams over and over and over and over had a nervous breakdown after failing it like the fifth time. That's 15 years of taking the SAT and failing it. And he had a nervous breakdown. I'm sorry. He had, an, he had a crisis. And God and Jesus revealed themselves to him and told him that he was Jesus's little brother. God's Chinese son. And if you didn't know that God had a Chinese son, and he, and he formed a Christian Chinese community that grew into the hundreds of thousands and then millions and waged a 15-year civil war. Exactly the same time America's civil war is going on, China's going through a 15-year civil war. Hear this, that killed more people than World War I. All because this guy talked to Jesus and God and had a divine mission 
to destroy Confucianism and Taoism and other heretical, idolatrous, <coughs> demonic things and establish the kingdom of heaven um, based on the Ten Commandments, Chinese style. It's radical stuff. Anyway, so that's, that's, that's the problem with being able to take it you know, time after time. If he hadn't been allowed to repeat it, history would have changed. This brought down the Qing Dynasty pretty much. Um, okay. Yeah, so, okay, Song Dynasty. Watch what happens in the Song Dynasty. No. Huh? I'm just spinning circles because I like to. There it is. Now look, uh, you know, I, I listen to me. I, 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 I sympathize with you. I know, I feel my pain. I have to teach 3,000 years in a semester. So, um, but, but bear with me because the end of this wave is one of the most mind-boggling mind things ever. So, okay, so there's the tongue. They don't have the... That's interesting. They don't have the they don't have the Grand Canal there. Oh Lord have mercy. Okay, yeah, there's the Grand Canal. Check that out. Can you see it? There's the uh, the Yangtze. It goes to the Song capital, the Tong capital, and all the way up to Beijing. It's like bigger than the Great Wall. It's not really. It's oh, it's a third of the distance of the Great Wall. Now, so okay, so here we are. 
the Song Dynasty, just like the Jin Dynasty, we have our next group of nomads. And they're these guys up here. The Jurchens. The Jurchens are interesting. They will reform and wave four and become the Manchus who, who established the Qing dynasty. They just, the, the Jurchens form a confederation and call themselves Manchu. It's the same group of nomads. And notice, they're close to Korea. There's a lot of Manchurians in Korea. Um, so here's the Song dynasty. Watch what happens to it. Whoops. There's our Silk Road. We've seen that before. What just happened to the Song Dynasty? Yeah. It happened again. The, uh, the Jurchens conquered the Yellow River. Hey, are you with me over there? So the second time, China has lost its Yellow River now to barbarians again. How do you think the Southern, how do you think the southern Song did after that? About pretty good, because they had rice. Pretty good, because they had rice. Well, they wouldn't be good because now they have a great canal that goes right to the capital. Oh, yeah. But right. Right. Now, really nice place. now, but you got all this. So let's let's follow up. Let's follow up on um, on Tate's point here. They do have still all of the wealth of the Yangtze Basin, which is the commercial capital of China now and still is today. Notice Shanghai's down here. Shanghai's down here on the yellow. It's on the. I'm sorry, on the Yangtze's mouth. The 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 Yangtze River is the commercial capital. It's, yeah, but did they lose the way? Yeah, they lost the they lost yeah. the way. Yeah, so now that's the best place to hide. Where can you sell your goods if you can't if you can't? What are your other market possibilities? Okay, India. entrepreneurs and business types. South. South. India. South. Okay, you're gonna go down to the savages in Vietnam. No, conquer the area in Japan and then sell your goods to them. They started building ships. You got a problem? You can't flow that way. I love to put it in Dallas terms. You can't flow that way. You got all this wealth. You want to trade? Build ships and flow that way. Least resistance. Nobody's going to, like, kill you. And so they start building ships. Is this the dynasty that had all of the... No, no, no. That's coming. And this is setting it up, though. That's the Ming. Next week. So the Southern, the southern Song developed shipbuilding technology. Check this out. Developed shipbuilding technology that is massively important. To, to understand why, I want, you notice that I don't like telling you, I like asking you and seeing if you can like figure out the problem. Here is the port of Southern Song, China. This is the point during the Song Dynasty in which places like Malaysia and Singapore get massive overseas Chinese populations that start settling in port cities because they're traders, right? They've got all, they've got silk, they've got rice, they've got so much, they've got jade, they've got paper, the Han invented paper. Uh, they got all this stuff. And so, Malaysia starts becoming strongly, strongly populated with Chinese, the, the Malaysian coast, and Indonesia, big Chinese population. And they end up within, before the end of the Song Dynasty, the Arabs, Persians, and Africans, and Indians, who had been trading in the Indian Ocean Basin for a thousand years, are eclipsed by the Chinese salesmen, the Chinese maritime sea salesmen, right? Merchants. Now, and they built the biggest boats that the world had seen and the most technologically advanced. Write this down, it's huge. We may as well hit this. The Song Dynasty, <coughs> technological inventions, technology. What did they invent that, is, that China's famous for? The compass. The compass. They invented the compass. They invented gunpowder at this time. Tong Song, they invented gunpowder. And they invented printing, the printing press, the printing press. Actually, Tong, Tong Song, yeah, so really, like, Tong Song, just think of Tong and Song together, that's good enough for one day. Tong and Song, right? So, the compass, gunpowder, including cannons, um, and what was the other thing? Paper? What was the other thing? The printing press. So with the printing press, the Song government, under those Confucians, those perfect Confucians, listen to me, please, I want to get, I want to, I have to finish this. Uh, with the printing press, this perfect Confucian government of truly meritorious officials, they are publishing state 
uh, sponsored and funded documents, pamphlets for peasants who can't read that are pictures of how to improve your agriculture. So these are public education printing presses run by the government to give to peasants who can't read so that they can learn how to farm more effectively. Um, it's an amazing, amazing advanced thing. Commercial inventions, too, start happening because they are trading such long distances. A letter of credit system starts developing. Banking practices start developing. Paper currency. A piece of paper now stands for a thousand pieces of silver because you can lose a piece of paper, and that's no problem. Um, promissory notes. Um, letters of credit. All sorts of banking things start happening. Paper money. Um, and now, also the biggest ships in the world. Now, you tell me. Look at the map. Here's the problem for you. Here's a good problem solver. Here's your puzzle, Emma. Why would the Chinese have to build such big ships? What's, what, what was the factor that caused the Chinese to build bigger ships than the Indians, than the Malays? The Malays were huge, important seafarers. Yeah. What is this connected to big ships? They need more room for inventory. Why would they need more room for inventory than, say, the Indians? Because they go so far and trade so much. That's right. That's right. Plus, they have to build the biggest everything. Because we're China. We have to build the biggest ships. Yeah, they've got, the long, they've got the biggest distance to go. And so they build the biggest ships in order to make their travel uh, rounds. Um, more lucrative. We've got more merchandise in our ships because it, it's expensive to make a return trip every time. So the more we can carry with us. And so not only do they make the biggest ships with incredibly um, effective uh, cotton canvas sails that can sail against the wind and all sorts of really cool things, but they also make watertight compartments so that if they run onto the rocks and the rocks like uh, push a hole into the hole, that would sink a ship without watertight compartments, but they actually coated it with a rubber type thing, so all of their storage compartments were waterproof. If, if you like break one part of the hole, only that section floods. The rest of them still have their air in them. And so just amazing stuff a thousand years ago. Europe doesn't even have a university at this point. Europe can't read, and they don't have a single trading city of note in a thousand. Yeah. So do they took like the biggest army too? Not yet. Okay. And so, yeah, and so the, the, the Southern Song Dynasty actually had more revenues from sea trade than they did from all of that, that wealth on the Yellow River. The sea trade of China takes off at this point. Right? So now you, see, now you see why we talk about the Northern Song. That's this whole thing. Look at the map. The Northern Song is before the Jurchens came, and then the Southern Song is when the Jurchens took the north. So twice now we've had barbarians conquer the, the Yellow River. Yeah? Did they start to value the merchant class? The, the, kind of like our guy in the Three Kingdoms clip, merchants have money and money is power and they, they've certainly got influence but they still don't have the honor. There are still laws against their sons joining the scholar official class, taking the exams, they're still discriminated against. But they're allowed to, they're allowed to trade. Okay, yep. And so, if you think this was bad, it all came to an end. Oh, no, one more thing. Manufacturing. And here's the, here's the mind-numbing thing, and I've got six minutes to get it. Don't start mentally packing, because this is the climax of the thing. The Song Dynasty, the Southern Song Dynasty, had a... a revolution where they started producing steel and iron using coal power. Using what? Coal. Coal to process steel. And they produced more steel than Great Britain did in the 1800s, which is when they had their industrial revolution. They were making factories and steamboats and steam engines and all of this stuff. Britain's industrial revolution Coal-powered steel machinery. China was making machines. Steel, they produced far more steel than Britain did in its Industrial Revolution. They had 
the printing press. They had a bustling economy, an open market, and technology obviously was just taking off. And so the question is, here's the mind-boggling question. What happened? Unfortunately, a guy named Genghis Khan conquered from over here in Vienna, right next to Austria, almost got Vienna, and got Persia and the Abbasid Empire and um, Russia and Central Asia and Korea. Genghis Khan conquered everything, and the last thing to fall was the Southern Song. And his grandson, Kublai Khan, finally took China. Hear this. this I mean, this is, if you have an imagination, if, you, if, you, if you're bored by this, just stop coming to school. Because right when China was poised in a developmental path towards an industrial revolution, which means they would have done it nine, 800 years before England did, the Mongols came and smashed it. And China didn't have what, all the, all the conditions were there. The only condition that wasn't there as conveniently as it was for Britain is that China's coal deposits are, are far from their cities. But they had the Grand Canal. There were ways that they could have exploited their coal. They have a lot of coal, but it was up in Manchuria and it was over here. England had coal so close to their rivers that that was a huge advantage for England. Water, power, and coal. That's what it takes to make steam. Yeah. Um, so, no, like, that's why the printing press was such an innovation in the 1400s, because it got, like, destroyed by paper. No, no, no. They didn't, they didn't, the, the, the printing press didn't get destroyed. Just the whole, the whole awesome. momentum, the whole, like, stability. Because right. suddenly you've got this guy who loves to kill your wife and kids and rape them, uh, in reverse order, maybe, in front of you before killing you, right? It just completely destroyed the order. Now the, and, th and this is the UN Empire. Han, P.O.D., Sui, Tong, Song, <laughs> UN. That's Genghis Khan's grandson, the Mongols. And so they strangle in the cradle this could have been industrial revolution. And let me just drive the point home and, and take this question down. If China had industrialized in 1200, England did it, for those of you who don't remember your history, England did it late 1700s, only 225 years ago, late 1700s. If China had done it in the 1200s, and they had modern weaponry, modern machinery, they had the technology that they didn't have when England came with it. If China had been the first, instead of, if, if Confucian, Taoist, China had been first, to have the power of modern industrial technology instead of capitalist Christian Britain. If China had been the one to be the first industrial power, how would history have changed? The British could not have invaded China and as, have blown them out of the water, which they literally did with their gunboats. They had the weaponry advantage. And they used it to just destroy China with industrial technology. If Genghis Khan had been born a hundred years later, and China in the, had had more breathing time to actually develop this, then maybe they would have had the technology to actually stop the Mongols. Because, hey, if Genghis Khan tried to, tried to invade Germany in the 1800s, the Germans just would have taken their machine guns and mowed them down. <laughs> Problem solved. Right? Yeah. Look at that. Just look at that. How, how different would the world be today? Yeah. But then, if China was so far ahead, how did it not have more advanced than Genghis Khan? Genghis Khan, you notice that, you notice, it's a good question, you notice that China was the last to fall. The Mongols conquered all of, from Europe to Korea, and they tried to get Japan. They couldn't conquer China. The only time that they did, how the Mongols conquered, they were a million people, just a million. The capital of China had two million people. They were just a million people. But every city that they conquered, they, they made them fight with them or else I will rape your daughters and your wife and kill you. And so every city they conquered increased the size of their army until they had such a massive army after conquering the whole thing that overwhelming numbers poured into China. That's how they did it.
just just human waves, right? Does brute force, yes. How would the world be different if instead of Western notice? Negative golden rule, positive golden rule. I don't know how much history you know, but when the when the Europeans started conquering the world, they brought their Christian missionaries with them, and they forced their religion on the whole world. They brought their capitalist businessmen with them, and they conquered. If China had been the first to do it, they could have stopped Europe from doing it. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Right. Would the, would the North Pole be melting right now? Well, because you would have started industrializing earlier, so steam power would have been happening for longer. Really? Why so, why so confidently is the answer yes? Grasshopper. Okay, I'm going to...